Well, when you talk about resilience, if you look in the dictionary, it really talks about how when something doesn't go at, according to plan, how do you bounce back? And as we know, life is not a journey that's a straight road. There's definitely curves and bumps and sometimes some giant potholes, at least in Peoria here we have those too. But when you think about life, you know, we know that there's ups and downs. And how do we recover from that and bounce back and be resilient? And I'm just going to talk today a little bit about what I've learned through my journey. I was born a little person quite a few years ago. <laughs> and I was born in a time when you really didn't see little people outside of, say, a circus. And so it was quite a surprise to my parents when they were told that I was a little person. And the doctor said, take her home and you treat her like everybody else. And I like to think that my parents would have done that anyway. But back then it was unusual because a lot of times, you know, anybody with any type of disability really was not into the mainstream of school and, and especially work. So that's kind of where my journey started. And then I didn't know I was little until I went to kindergarten. And the kids prominently told me, you know, and asked me, why are you so little? And I had no idea. And so I know how it feels to be on the outside of a circle. And of course, as we grew older, the gap in the height increased and, you know, it became very obvious. But it's also benefit because we all have differences, as my mom told me, and some you can see, but most you can't. We all have our challenges. Some you can see and some you can't. So as I talk today, think about your journey in life and what makes you resilient and see if any of these topics that I'm going to talk about can maybe resonate with you. So do you ever have a time in life when you feel vulnerable? I think today with the pandemic, we all feel somewhat vulnerable today. And of course, a large part of that is the uncertainty of, you know, how and if you're going to get the virus. And then also the uncertainty of when is this going to be over? <laughs> I think we're all anxious for this to be over. And we don't know when, you know, we're going to get back to somewhat of a normal life. And that causes a lot of anxiety, and, and we all feel vulnerable. In this picture you see, I was 13 years old, and it was my first surgery in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins, and I had two hip surgeries. What, you? There you go. Okay. I had two hip surgeries. And so I was in a body cast for the summer. And so this is how I spent my summer vacation. You know when you go back to school and they go, what did you do on your summer vacation? This is what I did on my 13th summer vacation. And, you know, where do you go from there? I'm flat on my back. I went to the bathroom on my back. I ate on my back. I, I was on my back the whole summer. And, you know, it really took the family and friends around to really make the summer pass because I couldn't go outside because of the heat. And what do you do? And my grandma would come over during the days and... Truthfully, that's when I got hooked on all my children, the soap opera. Because <laughs> Grandma would want to watch the soap opera. I'd want to watch the Cub game and watch the Cubs lose, because I'm a Cardinal fan. So we would swap between the two. And, you know, it was a very valuable time for me with my Grandma. And, you know, the time really did sort of pass once you got used to the routine. Because it also, you know, affected my family. Because everything evolved around the living room with me being in the, in the hospital bed. And so when you think about it, life is like a weeble wobble. I'm aging myself a bit. For those that don't know what a weeble wobble is, it's this blow up uh, doll type thing that came in different, you know, this one was a bozo, but it came in all kinds of characters. And when you hit it, it fall down, but it always bounced back up. And that's what we have to do in life. We have to be able to bounce back up because we are always going to have challenges in front of us. But it's also how you think about that challenge. Do you see it as a challenge or do you see it as an opportunity? And during this time, if you think about it, there's a lot of people who have lost their jobs, who are in financial straits and, and they don't know where their next rent's coming from. You have other people who have lost loved ones or have loved ones in the hospital that are lingering and hopefully are going to pull through the, the COVID. 
And then you have the regular life problems that happen, you know, within family and friends, just regular life. So it is a challenging times. And also, as you feel like the weeble wobble's laying down, it probably is for a lot of reasons. And you have to really think about how to pick yourself up. Kind of like in the summer, I felt like my weeble wobble was down the whole summer. And when was I going to pop back up? And when you think about it, even though there's a lot of emphasis in life on being independent, and especially for children, we always tell our children we want you to be independent. I would argue that the most successful life is an interdependent one. We all depend on people for different things, and people depend on us. We thrive because of people, not in spite of them. The goal in life is not just to survive, it's actually to thrive. And people help us do that. And if you think about all the things that you've been successful at, how many times have you done it all by yourself? with no involvement and no help. Can you think of a time? I can't, because everything I've ever been successful at, there were a lot of people behind me, every step of the way. So an interdependent life means that we can lean on people, people support us, and we can actually reach our goals and thrive in life. So when you think about independence, I want you to think about being interdependent and think about all the people who have helped you along the way and who you have helped, because it's a two-way street. And in my book, I talk a lot about the people who have helped me along the way and what they've done for me and how I've tried to return that help. Because as being a leader at Caterpillar, I believe in servant leadership, where our job is to serve others. And I also believe that in my private life my personal life, that I think we're all here to serve others. Because people need each other, especially during times like this, where we have to reach out to people and make sure they're okay or help them in some way. You know, have you checked on your neighbors? Have you checked on, you know, some people who are older who you might be worrying about? Don't be afraid to reach out to them. Because remember, interdependence is the key to thriving in life. When you think about the people around you, when I grew up, we sat down at the dinner table every night. And my parents would always ask us about our day. And when you're in grade school, for instance, the funniest thing that happened during the day was when Johnny puked in the hallway. <laughs> Remember when somebody puked and it was the talk of the school the whole rest of the day? And so when my parents would ask us what happened, you know, my sister and brother and I all went to the same grade school for quite a number of years. So we'd all know when somebody puked. And we'd just talk about it at dinner. And finally my parents would say, okay, that was interesting. Okay, what else happened in school? Or what issues are you challenged with? And it was really this kitchen table concept that really helped me form the thought process of how I deal with my challenges. Are people going to stare at me? How am I going to get through this subject, etc.? And so as I've gone through life, I notice that I have a kitchen table around me. It's a small group of people that I depend on for when I have something that's quite challenging or something that's even good. You're thinking about buying a new car, for example, and should you or shouldn't you? Or should you take this vacation? Or should I propose to someone? You have this small group of people that you really go to first. And I call that my kitchen table. And we all should have a kitchen table. And your kitchen table changes as you go through life and it depends on the subject that you're struggling with or, being, or you have an opportunity for. Because you swap people in and out depending on what it is you're facing. And it's an interesting concept that from childhood I always felt like I have a kitchen table when something happens I have these few people I know I can pick up the phone and call. And I want to be in the kitchen table for other people as well. I, I want people to know that I'm there and they can call me when they need me. And so think about your kitchen table and how it's changed throughout your life and depending on what you're facing. So it's an interesting concept. And don't forget to be a part of other people's kitchen table to give back. Also, 
we have this stigma about asking for help, that it's a sign of weakness. And I believe that asking for help is a strength, not a weakness. I ask for help every single day, especially for the physical stuff. Standing four feet tall, I do have my challenges. And you can see them, but I have other challenges that you can't see. <laughs> Don't think that my size is my only challenge. We all have challenges during the day. And when you think about it, your kitchen table is there to help you, your family is there to help you, your friends, and any other type of person or resource that you can reach out to. Don't be afraid to ask for help, especially during this time. If you read about all the counseling services and things like United Ways 211, their call volume has doubled during this pandemic because people are finding themselves in situations that they never dreamed that they would be in. And yet they're reaching out for help. But then you have people who don't reach out for help and we really need to be aware of the people around us so that we recognize when someone might need something. The worst thing is to find out that somebody's suffering and you didn't know about it. And it's okay to say, hey, I'm just checking in. Is there something I can do? So remember one of the greatest strengths is to ask for help because that is the greatest thing you can do for yourself and for others is to ask for help and also be there to help others. Make the first move. Everything I've talked about up to now, if you notice, it's about you taking that first step. And believe me, that first step is most of the time the hardest one to take. It takes a lot of courage to Take the first step, whether it's to ask for your kitchen table or to call someone, to call 211, or just say, I need help, I'm, I'm struggling. And it really is hard to make that first move. But when you think about making the first move, what do you have to lose? You don't have anything to lose but to go ahead and take that first step towards getting whatever it is that you need. And so when you walk into a room and say you're going to a reception, do you search out people who look like you or someone you thought you might be able to connect with? Or are you the type of person that goes up to someone that's totally different than you and you want some diversity and thought and experience? I encourage you to have the courage to go up to that person you normally wouldn't go up to and start chit-chatting. Because learning new things from different people I have found is some of the biggest growth that I've ever had in my life. But I would tell you it's really hard to walk up to somebody I don't know because I know in the first 10 or 15 seconds if they're going to look past my size. And sometimes they don't and I know it. So it's just I kind of gracefully move on. But most of the time people are very open to everyone. So don't be afraid to step in. I know how hard it is. I, I think about it every single time I meet a new person. What are they going to think and are they going to look past my size and really engage in a conversation? And humor helps with that. My parents said I was born with the gift of gab. I don't know if I was. I don't know if it's nature or nurture. Part of me thinks that because people would shy away from me, I had to learn to, to walk towards them and I use humor a lot of the time. And that's a good way to start a conversation. And so when you do it, you may want to try using humor or even talk about the weather. Today when I walked in, we all were talking about the weather. <laughs> and we laughed that you talk about the weather, but it's pouring down rain. So whatever you can start a conversation with and you're comfortable with, that's a way to make that first move. And as hard as it is, as hard as it is I think you'll find that it really works and you start to get confidence. And you also start to build your village. Once you get past your kitchen table, the next group of people, which is a larger group of people, I call it my village, they're the ones that also walk with you through your life's journey. And I have a whole village behind me that's made my career and my life successful. I certainly didn't do this by myself because it wouldn't have happened. So I have a very large village through my life that has helped me be very successful in what I want to do. But it also takes the first move. So try different things as you make your first move. What works for you? And don't be afraid to try it. And if something doesn't work, 
you try the next thing. So I want to talk about perspective. The title of my book, Looking Up, is really about not just that I've looked up to people because most people are taller than me, literally my whole life, but it taught me to look up to people figuratively. We all have value, every single one of us. And we have to let our preconceived notions go away when you meet somebody and peel that onion and think about who is this person and what can I learn from them and what can they learn from me. But it's all about that perception when you walk up to somebody. I know what people, a lot of people think when they see me. Look at that little person. What, what does she do or who is that? And, and I get that. But I also want you to get that there's much more to me than my size because I'm a shell first. I just happen to be a little person. And we all happen to be something, right? So being little doesn't define me. It's just a part of who I am. And your perception really can lead you down a very good path or it can lead you down a path that isn't so positive. But it's all about you and how you look at that situation and how you look at that person. Because we all have value. So when you walk in a room or your boss gives you an assignment or during the pandemic something's not going right with your business or something, are you viewing that as a challenge and a problem? Or are you saying, you know what, we have an opportunity here. Let's we look at how we're doing things. And think about all the new businesses that have sprouted up during this pandemic. The restaurants who now have carry out are, are going to continue to do carry out. Businesses that have totally changed their business model to adjust to people not being able to come to the store. And their online business is booming globally because of some things that they changed. Also, think about all the positive things that are happening in the world. When you turn on the news, granted the first 20 minutes is news and all that other stuff, but then they always have a story at the end. I wish they'd start with a good story and end with a good story. At the end, they always have someone that is helping a neighbor or some children have a lemonade stand so that they can donate money to the food bank. Think about all the good in your neighborhood where people are reaching out and helping people. They're going to the store with the older folks so the older folks don't have to go and possibly get COVID. They're going to the store for them. Or the stores now are delivering to us more than they ever have. And it's all because our perception is, while this is not an ideal time in many ways, it is an ideal time for innovation. Innovation in your business and innovation in our personal lives and innovation in how we're thinking and how we're perceiving this situation. So whatever you're thinking, if you t twist your perception just a little bit, you maybe will see an opportunity instead of a challenge. And we fight this every day. So this picture you see was President Obama wanted to expand a program of his called 100,000 Strong that supported students to, to study globally. The Caterpillar Foundation was a funder of that. So they wanted three companies to come in along with some educational folks to talk about how they could expand the program. Well, they asked Caterpillar to come, and since I was the president of the foundation, I went into the White House to talk about it. And while I'm sitting there, you forget who you're with, and I'm really deep into the discussion. We're in the Roosevelt Room, which is next to the Oval Office. And usually if you're in the Roosevelt Room, the president does make an appearance at some time, and he was supposed to come in for about five minutes. And I completely forgot, because I'm really talking about the program, and I was getting excited when the door flies open, and then walks the president. And he says, hello, folks. And it, even though I knew, it stunned me for a second. And I thought, how did I go from Washington, Illinois, to Washington, D.C., with the President of the United States. And it was because of the work of the Caterpillar Foundation and the impact that the program was having. And he stayed in there for 45 minutes, way past his time. His aides were all getting nervous and doing all their dancing, trying to get his attention. And we came up with some really brilliant ideas during that total hour 
that really is going to impact a lot of students. And it makes you feel really good when you have an opportunity to have an impact on people you don't even know. But you do know it's a good program. So during this time, I also want you to think, how can I make a bigger impact on others? Because there's no better feeling than to know that you've helped someone. Finally, I'd like to leave you with my favorite, one of my favorite African proverbs. And it talks about no matter how dark and long the night, the dawn will always break. And that no one can dim your personal light within us. And what I mean by that is, well, we are in the most challenging time. Who would have ever thought that you could wear a mask and go into a bank and ask for money? <laughs> Who would have ever thought that? But you can. Think about it. You know, eight months ago, you would have been in prison. Now you can't go in a bank without a mask. So let's laugh about what we have and embrace the challenges that we're facing because this is going to break. It's probably not going to break for a while, and it's not going to break all at once. And that's okay. Think of the time we're spending with our family and friends that we never would have had. Never. And you have to spend time now with family and friends. And we're all embracing that as a gift. We have been given a gift of a lifetime. Before, everybody was running through life and not enjoying what we have with our blessings. So the dawn will break through this. And I want you to hang on to that thought. And keep looking up because the view is great. Amen. Thank you.